and you know, obviously that's what we're interested in if we're talking about breakouts and tensile fractures. But I haven't given a definition of what well bore steel is. Okay. And so that's because the definition or the answer is, well, it depends. <laughs> so how many wells do you think experience breakouts? All of them. Basically, all, all wells that are drilled will have some amount of breakouts. All, all of those, and in fact, maybe possibly most of them, don't have stability issues. And part of that's through design. There's, there's certain mud weight windows, casing string designs, and other things that prevent unstable well bores. But for, the, but for the most part, just because you see breakouts doesn't mean they'll lead to well bore instability. And that's because if the breakout widths are narrow enough in the beginning, right, if the breakout widths are narrow enough, right, so this material starts to fail, and it fails in a narrow enough region, well, now you have an even higher stress concentration there. Right? So any anytime you have a crack or a notch, you know, I mean, the Kirsch equations give you the solution that show you that there's like a four time stress concentration at the wall, right? At the wall of the well bore, okay? At the wall of a hole, right? That's a perfect hole. But if you sharpen that flaw in the material in any way, right? to you know, the sort of extreme would be the, the sharpest thing you can imagine would be a crack, then the stress concentration is only going to increase. Right? So the sharper the flaw, the higher the stress concentration. And so in this case, you know, what was a perfect circle and had a stress concentration, now you've, you've made it more elliptical, you've made the corners more sharp, and you're going to get just increased breakout depths and not widths, okay, to the extent that eventually, you know, you get, get something that's pretty sharp. So in a, in a stable well bore, you'll have breakouts that will just increase with depth because of the stress concentration gets higher and higher at, at the edges, okay. This is typically is not a problem because you can still remove this material with the drilling mud. An unstable well bore, you know, occurs when you have, and, and sometimes we talk about well bore collapse because what happens essentially is that you cannot remove the cuttings fast enough, right, with the drilling mud, and so eventually they'll just, what apparently, they fall down on the bottom on the bottom hole assembly, right, and so therefore, it's called you know well bore collapse because you can't remove the material, and if and it's a you know fairly dangerous and certainly costly thing to happen. Because at that point, you have to do some corrective measure. You have to deviate the well. You have to set casing. You have to do something. Right? And so in an unstable well uh, is where your breakouts aren't confined to some, or your breakout widths aren't confined to some small region. And instead of getting narrower, the well bore, they just continue to break out further and further along the edges to the extent that eventually you have a, what's called a washout. And so in a washout, it's, it's a complete, it's a complete um, enlargement of the wellbore diameter. Right? So you have breakouts from all sides and the material's falling down and it can't be removed. Yeah? So um, place welding can also increase washout strength. I'm sorry? Yeah, I mean, what happens is, effectively, when it, when you have when it absorbs the water, the effect you have an increase in effective stress, which exceeds the strength of the cohesion of the material, and then the material fails, and it and it happens on all sides. Right. So that's that's a sort of coupled phenomenon that, that I'm not really talking about here. So here we're talking about just from the mechanical loads, the in situ stresses, and the fact that there's a hole there. But but that's certainly in a you know a fully coupled geomechanical model that you'd be able to model that kind of thing, right. but it's a, it's the same idea. You've you've increased the stress is higher than the cohesive st strength of the material, so it fails and it falls into the wellbore. Right. 
It just the mechanism there has to do with the fluid dissolution, not not necessarily only because of the mechanical loads, right? just the presence of an excipient stress. So, anyway, empirical models suggest that something about 90 degrees. So your breakout width of about 90 degrees here. If you can if you can keep the breakout width to less than 90 degrees then you'll have stable wellbores, right? So that's an empirical, that's an empirical model that I would say many, many, most wells are designed to this sort of thing, right? Okay. But if you have a, if you have a fully sort of coupled geomechanical model, you can play with things like the fact that, well, okay, the breakouts are occurring, but then I can, you know, increase the mud weight at some, by some amount to prevent the total collapse of the wellbore, right? And so you can you can do things, you can play with things uh, where you can you could possibly get away with higher than uh, 90 degree uh, breakout widths. And so this was a well bore that was designed to that 90, 90 degree criteria. And so when they, when, they, when they went through and they did the predictions for the breakout widths, what they realized was that there's this region between 7,500 and 8,000 feet where we're going to have higher than 90 degree breakout widths. And therefore, they set casing to that depth. And they went on. But if you have a fully if you have like a, a full model where you can uh, sort of do four field visualization. So over here, this is a un unconfined compressor strength of the material. Uh, this is the mud weight in, in, uh, parts, in parts per gallon, I think, PPG. So this is the mud weight. And what these contours are of breakout width. So this is like 160, 140, 120, 100, 90. And so what they're trying to do is What they were trying to, well, what the goal is, is to keep, so this is the 80 degree contour. So if you can keep, if you can keep the conditions over here, then you'll be safe, right? You'll be below the 90 degree threshold. And what was sort of discovered is that if they were to simply just raise the from 11 ppg to 11 and a half ppg, so this is 80 degrees here. So just by going up uh, half uh, ppg on the mud weight, then they could have achieved a stable and that was a stable well bore, and they and they might have not had to set casing to this depth, right, which has saved some money. And then of course, in down here, even below the depth of which they set casing. These are right on the, we're on the edge of the 90 degree threshold, and all of these would have been shifted over by just adjusting the mud weight by half a ppg. Now that doesn't mean you you can always do that. So you can't always just increase the mud weight, because if you increase the mud weight too much, you can exceed what's called the frac gradient, right? And so this is the the pressure at which will and you will cause tensile-induced hydraulic fractures, right? And those can lead to lost circulation. So who knows what the difference between the frac gradient and the pore pressure is called? Hmm? The mud window, right? The mud window. Okay. And so here's another case study where the frac gradient and the pore pressure were used to, to you know, so the, the sort of shaded area between these two curves is the mud window, where the lower bound is the frac gradient, I'm sorry, the, the lower bound is the pore pressure, and the upper bound is the frac gradient. And casing was designed. 
And this, this is the casing string that was developed. But, so this, you know, th this is the original casing design that they went out in the, in the, in the, in the field. Uh, now when they got out there and they started drilling, they, they started to run into some issues with breakouts and were afraid of, they were afraid of um, having, you know, unstable wellbore, well, you know, uh, wellbore collapse problems. And that narrowed the mud window, right? That narrowed the mud window because now the, the, the pore pressure wasn't the lower bound. It was in fact the collapse pressure. They had to drill over balanced to keep to, to provide stability to prevent um, to prevent the wellbore from collapsing and that ended up you had this extremely narrow window right here extremely narrow w window right here and in fact when they did drill this so this was the original casing design when they did drill this I think they had to set like two additional casing strings or, or they had to deviate the well twice and set casing an additional time or something to get through this so they had a real big problem in actually drilling this well. And so in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, what do you call it, a, a backwards looking way. So, so, you know, these two, this was a model considering the collapse pressure and this is the ultimately the final casing design. And so, but this was done a posterior, right, after the fact. So, so this is what the original casing design, they went out, they drilled the well, they had a lot of problems. And they said, well, if we had a fully coupled geomechanical model where we can include the collapse pressure, we can, we can include not, you know, we don't set the lower bound as the pore pressure, but set the lower bound as the collapse pressure. Then, then they asked themselves, if we knew, with, with that knowledge, what casing design would we have developed? And then they came up with this casing design, again, this after the fact, and this casing design would have given much la larger uh, mud weight windows. And also, if you look, there, if you can count the casing string, there's one less. So th this design would have saved millions of dollars. And possibly, I mean, it would save a million dollars even, even up front. But when you consider the fact they had to, you know, uh, deviate the well twice and take other measures to correct to get through this window, it would have saved, uh, you know, time and, and other things. So having a fully, you know, a fully sort of well-designed geomechanical model that includes, you know, doesn't just use the pore pressure as the, as the lower bound in any mud weight window, but includes the effects that, you know, uh, fracture, that, that in, in <coughs> breakouts, consideration of breakouts, and the, st and the pressures that you can use to stabilize breakouts and other things, you, you can save a lot of money. And of course, the stuff we'll do in this class is fairly unsophisticated. You, you could do things that are much, much more sophisticated using much more complex material models than we'll look at in our class. So, but hopefully this gives you some motivation, at least to the importance of this stuff. Um, I mean, this is the difference in this and that's a couple of million bucks just by understanding the mechanics. So, I mean, it's, as long as we've been drilling wells, you'd think we'd be more advanced than we are, but this, these mud weight issues are still an important problem. And in fact, uh, Dr. Dr. Gray uh, actually has an industrial affiliates program, and the name of the, f the, name of the affiliates program is called Wider Windows, right? with, the, with the ultimate goal of widening mud weight windows to... Uh, provide safety and, and drill more efficiently, cost-effectively. Okay, we'll stop there.